We have Eugene Charniak here today, um, and I'll give a little story. Uh, we've known one another for about 25 mm -hmm. years. Uh, in 1982, uh, when I arrived at Yale as a fresh graduate student, um, I had a choice between working with Roger Shank on natural language processing uh, or uh, Drew McDermott on space and time. Uh, and I'd, I'd really come to, to, to Yale to work with Drew, but I was pretty I thought natural language was pretty cool. But I read his thesis at, from MIT. Uh, and uh, Got depressed. Uh, <laughs> there's a story, a little story that, that he put at the beginning that he wanted to understand. Uh, and I'll probably get this wrong, but it was something like um, uh, Sally told Fred that uh, she bought Jack a kite for his birthday present. Um, and Fred said, uh, Jack already has a kite. Um, he will make you take it back. And so I, I started building parsers and thinking about how to do that and using the idiosyncratic kinds of parsers that they had at, uh, at Yale. And I thought, God, this is a hard problem. Uh, and so I immediately went and worked with Drew. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then three years later, uh, I, uh, uh, I was hanging around with my thesis halfway done, uh, and Eugene comes uh, to work with Drew on a book, uh, which was going to eclipse the best-selling book at the time, which was written by uh, Patrick Winston. Uh, and this was before uh, Peter uh, had uh, done his book, uh, which and ultimately eclipsed uh, uh, Drew and, uh, and Eugene. Uh, and and he hired me to come back to Brown with him. Um, and at Brown, I thought he was really cool because he had two Lisp machines. <laughs> <laughs> two. two. Because you needed two. Because you needed two for parts. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he gave me one, uh, the one that wasn't working. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, uh, and, and he was working on. Um, um, uh, message passing or, or marker passing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't really happy with them at the time. Uh, and there was this new thing going around that Yuta Pearl was working on uh, called probabilistic graphical models. And Eugene was one of the first people to start really embrace that uh, and start uh, pushing hard on it. Well, actually, in large part, uh, Glenn was a major influence on me at that time. Glenn Carroll was one of his graduates. <laughs> <laughs> I worked in the marker passing too, and I hated it. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and, and Eugene wrote a very famous paper, or at least famous in the annals of AI. Uh, and it has some silly title. I can't remember what it was. But, but he had a great title. It was called Pearl for Swine, uh, which means Yuta Pearl's view of graphical models for the rest of us, basically. Uh, and it's still circulating. And lots of people still use it uh, as, as their text. Um, uh, about uh, seven or eight years later, uh, Eugene uh, was chair of the department. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, he didn't get bogged down in all the minutia, or somehow he managed to separate time. And that was the time where he wrote a book uh, called Statistical, um, was it Statistical Natural Language Processing? Statistical Language Learning. Statistical Language Learning, yes, um, which is a classic today. Uh, and probably many of you have read it. Uh, and he continues to this day to be uh, the consummate hacker. I don't know where you picked that up, probably from MIT, uh, but he's never stopped. Uh, for, whether it's the, uh, on the list machine, uh, or Texas Instruments machines, or uh, now he programs in C++. Uh, and, uh, um, and today he's going to talk to us about uh, some of his latest work, um, which I'm sure he has hacked uh, and built the systems himself. Uh, Mostly. Uh, without further ado, Eugene on uh, phenomenal uh, anaphora uh, resolution, which I still don't really understand what it means. <laughs> okay, well, you will s very shortly. Thank you. Um, but Glenn, wasn't it you who told me about um, about graphical models? I don't think so. I mean, my work was on proofs for correctness for the marker passing, the probabilities in that. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. Um, okay, I'm going to be talking about uh, pronominal anaphora resolution, and in particular, unsupervised, 
using, excuse me, EM or X to the expectation maximization algorithm. Um, this is joint work with Mika Elsner, a PhD student at Brown. Excuse me. Um, the previous work <coughs> on pronoun and aphra is huge. Um, I'm just going to mention a few pieces that have directly inspired this work. Uh, some old work at Brown with Niu G, John Hale, and I, uh, this was back in 1990, uh, was on this problem. Uh, some very recent work at Berkeley was the, uh, was the immediate sort of goad that caused me to start working on this. And after it was essentially done, uh, Mika pointed out or discovered that there was, in fact, some previous work that was, in many respects, quite similar to what we have done. And uh, this is by Cherry and Bergsma. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. I, you know, I could, if you're interested at the end, I would be happy to go through the differences, uh, you know, why, but I won't. Okay, so anaphora is the process of a piece of text referring back to something mentioned earlier in the text. Okay, um, and so anaphora resolution is determining what that something is. So in Alice fed the dog, he wagged his tail. The he refers back to the dog, and which is said to be the antecedent of he. Um, in the literature, there are two terms that are sometimes used interchangeably, but less and less so. One is to say that something is a referent, and the other is to say that it's an antecedent. Um, the term referent has been taken over by the um, logicians. And so the referent of the dog, or let's say the referent of Eugene Charniak, is this thing right here. It's the thing in the world. Okay, within a piece of text, so text doesn't have reference. Okay, it just there's just the text there, and so instead we talk about anaphora and antecedents, which are just other pieces of text. So you're still trying to figure out what that kite means, whether it was it or that or yes, it was Jack that, that's or right. Fred or sure. <laughs> Except now I'm doing it statistically, ah. and the hard problems like. The one that I proposed, I'm just writing off as too difficult for the time being. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking about pronouns here. Uh, and in particular, we're going to just going to be talking about personal pronouns. Personal pronouns are I, you, he, she, it, they, mine, his, hers, etc. We're not dealing with, there are many other kinds of pronouns. We're not dealing, for example, with demonstrative pronouns, this or that. Uh, we're not dealing with interrogative pronouns, the uh, who ate the cookie, okay, or several other types. Okay. Uh, personal pronouns are by far and away the most difficult slash most common. And so that's typically when people talk about pronoun anaphora, th this is what they're talking about. Um, personal pronouns come in several types. Uh, when they appear in subject position, there are things like I, he, and she, so I ate the, I ate the cookie. When uh, they appear in object position, um, then they, there's a different class of pronouns, objective pronouns. So uh, Fred welcomed me to San Francisco, okay, but I welcomed him to San Francisco, so he and him. Me and him are objective pronouns. There are possessive pronouns, my, me, his, hers. Reflexive pronouns, myself, himself, etc. The important thing to notice that in these cases, the type of the pronoun is determined not by the antecedent, who the pronoun refers back to, but instead just by the uh, syntactic role it plays in the sentence. And thus, it doesn't give any clues for who the antecedent is, and thus we're essentially just going to completely ignore it as far as this talk is concerned. 
There are things, however, that obviously are correlated in English with the antecedent. The uh, one is the pronoun number, singular versus plural, I versus we, uh, it versus they. Um, second property is person. Pronouns come in first, second, or third person, and that is also determined by who the antecedent is. Gender. Okay, in English we have semantic gender, i.e. the gender is somewhat related to the meaning of the object. Uh, so we know that uh, dogs are more likely to be he than, than probably she, possibly it, um, things like that, whereas Alice is almost surely feminine. Um, as opposed to pronoun types, these are definitely determined by the antecedent, not by the syntactic role. A huge complicating factor here is that many pronouns are non-anaphoric, i.e. there is no antecedent in the text. And this can be for two possible reasons. One is the pronoun doesn't have a referent, okay, and that occurs, for example, there's a class of pronouns called weather it's, as in it is raining. So it's used in, in when you're talking about the weather is just sort of, I don't know, it is raining means what? The atmosphere, the weather is raining, I don't know. But it's not anaphoric. There are things like, uh, other things that don't have antecedents are things like uh, the it in, okay, so Alice got married. It is unfortunate that her relatives do not like him. The it in it is unfortunate de definitely has no referent, okay? Now, there are non-anaphoric pronouns that do have reference, reference and the, here the him at the end. There's no antecedent for the him. There's no piece of text that talks about the him, but presumably there is a there is someone who Alice got married to, and whoever that is, that's the referent. Okay? We are not going to distinguish in this talk between pronouns. Bet we're just going to say either pronouns are anaphoric or non-anaphoric. We're not going to distinguish between why they're non-anaphoric. All we have to do is say, no, this pronoun does not have an antecedent, and I'm not going to link it up to anything. So how about partially anaphoric? Alice got married and they went to Hawaii. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> uh, that I would say that's non I would say that's non anaphoric because if if you said Alice got married to Bill, well actually no, that's still non it uh, yeah. gets messy. Anything that difficult we're just gonna get wrong. I mean wait until you see the results. The results here are very low. All I'm gonna claim is is that that they're better than anyone else's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a very difficult problem. People have this idea that this is an easy problem, that you just pick the last mentioned object of the, you know, and that's it. Forget it. That does about 25%. If you do the last mentioned object of the same gender, that does a bit better, but it's a very hard problem. Um, so, we're going to be talking about learning to do this task without any marked up data. And the technique we're going to use is the expectation maximization algorithm. And to use EM, you need what is called a generative model, which is a probabilistic model that assigns probability to all possible model inputs. So in our case, the inputs are, are simply a sequence of pronouns, okay? And we have to assign a probability to those pronouns based upon the possible antecedents. And um, so that's basically what our input is. Generally, when you talk about a generative model, you talk about it generating the entire text. Um, in our case, the only piece of the text we care about are the pronouns. So yes, there's something that generates all the rest, but we don't have to talk about it here because it's I'm, we're assuming that that has no influence on pronoun anaphora. So here is a very simple generative pronoun model that's pretty much the way this thing works. 
And if you want to know some of the dirt, uh, you know, the, more precisely, I could talk about it at the end. But this is the model that I'm going to assume for this talk. Given that we're about to generate a pronoun, we first guess, is there an antecedent with some fixed probability? Okay, so this is the typical, quote, generative story. We admit, so we flip a coin. If it comes out heads, we say there's an antecedent. If it comes out tails, we say there isn't, and then we're done. Um, if there is an antecedent, of course, the, that's not really, it's not 50-50, but uh, if there is an antecedent, we guess which one of the previous noun phrases is the, mo is the closest antecedent, because very often there could be more than one noun phrase in the text. We're, we will just be, that refers to the same object. We're just going to be concerned with the closest one. Um, and this is based upon the position of the antecedent, and I will go into more detail about that later. Once we now have made a guess about what the antecedent is, now based upon that antecedent, we guess what, if the pronoun will be singular or plural. We guess if the pronoun, we guess the pronoun's gender based on the antecedent. Um, and we also uh, guess the number of the pronoun, first, second, or third. And then we choose the antecedent that makes the pronoun most likely. That's the, that's the basic idea. So for those of you who care about the math, so this is sort of a very simple version of we want argmax, and I forgot to put in that should be argmax i. Um, so of all the possible antecedents i, we look for the one such that is most, that makes p of a equals i, given the article, highest, okay? I.e., we want the most probable. And that's equivalent in this formulation to argmax i of p of a given i given the previous uh, context times the p of gender given i, times the p of person given i, times the p of number given i. The, essentially, I'm just repeating now in math form what I said before in, um, in just a generative model. Now, the second equation is more problematic. What this equation, this, this encodes an assumption I'm making that the problem, that this first piece, when I said, probability of A of I given previous in the, t in the second line. I'm now saying that what that really is is probability of A g g equals I given all the information about the previous pronouns and noun phrases. Okay. Or to put it another way, um, if the antecedent, and I'm assuming that, this is equal to, or approximated by, the probability that A equals I, just given the information about the antecedent I. Okay, so I'm assuming that the probability that it refers to George is independent of what other individuals are sitting around George. Now, this, this is clearly false, and even worse for you statistics gurus, it means that when I use the maximum likelihood estimator to estimate these probabilities, it's going to be biased, inconsistent, and bad for your health. Okay. Uh, the problem is trying to fix this ain't easy, and it's not high in my agenda. Yes. So that's the previous, so I'm seeing the right-hand side, and there is no article on the right-hand side of the first equation there. The, uh, the of a uh, that just means previous, previous stuff in the article. Previous article. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make clear that it doesn't include anything after the pronoun itself, or, the, or in fact, the pronoun. The, then, OK, so that's the basic equations and the warning about the estimator. <clears throat> um, I put that in because Michael Jordan was very, at Berkeley, was very unhappy that I didn't 
be more explicit about this. Um, I'm going to assume that the input is completely parsed. Um, I'm going to further assume that any um, that the antecedent of a pronoun is some noun phrase in the current or previous two sentences. This is right about 95% of the time. Um, the other 5%, some, uh, some of it's what's called cataphra, which means that the antecedent actually occurs after the pronoun. Uh, more common is that the antecedent is further back than two, than the two previous sentences. But at the, again, at this point, that's the least of our concerns. If we could get these 95% right, brother, would we be happy? So here's a simplified example of how this might work. So suppose we so the top table, we say if the position of the antecedent is the current sentence, then the probability that this is the antecedent is 0.2. If it's in the previous sentence, it's 0.15. If it's two sentences back, it's 0.10. Okay. Notice that these numbers don't sum to 1. Uh, that has a lot to do with uh, that assumption I made that I said made everything biased and inconsistent. Fernando, you look unhappy. No, I'm looking puzzled. I think I don't understand that point. Uh, so, I'm, I'm not sure what that table says. There's something about conditioning here that's kind of bothering me. And I'm not sure that I yeah, get, well, know how to articulate yeah. it yet. Okay. So, it's like probability. So probability that this is the antecedent, or probability that so because you started it, with this gen, it's sort it's of a funny. It's not quite a generative model, right? Because it's not that I say. Um, no, it's a generative model. It's just biased and inconsistent. Well, the bias part I understand. So can you, can you repeat the point about the not adding up to one? Maybe that all I don't quite understand that. Okay, suppose that it were true that all antecedents are in the previous two sentences. Suppose English were designed that way. Okay. And suppose that there were quite literally three possible antecedents, one in the current sentence, one, one back, and one two back. And furthermore, suppose that this pronoun has an antecedent. It's not non-anaphoric. Under those conditions, these numbers should add up to 1. OK? They won't. They're going to add up, according to the numbers I made up, to approximately 0.45. And that's because of this assumption I'm making, that, everyone, the pro that everyone's probability of being the antecedent is independent of everyone else around him or her. If I hadn't made that assumption and I could actually gather these probabilities, then, and th then they would sum to one. But I, but I have to make this assumption because obviously the, the, the Gather statistics on, and so they don't sum to one. I mean, I, I sort of it, it, the reason I, I'm kind of a little bit puzzled by this is because you could have gotten around this problem in a different way, which is to have some kind of a, a factored model where you condition on the past decisions. Uh, I could say, well, you condition all the, the, the antecedent decisions for the, the past pronouns. In that case, you can have some, a model that is, uh, you know, uh, not deficient. Yes. You yeah. Could. But, and, but the, and the state splitting would be would be terrible. Well, we could. That that's. Uh, mm, maybe I, I'm not sure it why. It would be. Take my word for it. 
Okay. Don't take my word for it. Anyway. Well, I, I, I don't see why, but you know. Oh, okay. it, we can come back to yeah. it later. Okay. It would be. Okay. So, furthermore, um, suppose that we have the following probabilities, namely the word Alice is going to generate a masculine pronoun one time in 100, a feminine pronoun 92 times in 100, and a neuter pronoun uh, seven times in 100. They don't add up to one simply because of rounding errors. Um, those three numbers should add up to one, and they do, except I rounded them. Uh, similarly, dog is masculine. And these, by the way, are real numbers. These are the numbers that, uh, as opposed to the first set, these are numbers that my EM program comes up with. Um, dog is masculine 47%, uh, feminine 11%, neuter 42%. He, of course, is always masculine. Uh, so in Alice fed the dog, he ate the food. Okay, We would look and say, well, it might be, he might be Alice or the dog. In both cases, they are in the w sentence one back, and so the probability of antecedent given position is 0.15. Uh, the genders, however, are quite different, and so the probability that the that Alice will generate a fem uh, a masculine <laughs> pronoun is 0.01, while the probability that the, that the dog will generate a masculine pronoun is 0.47, and the result is that we're much more likely to generate the dog, to generate he from the dog than from Alice, and we get to make the right decision. So that's a very simple example of how this would work. Uh, one question, what's the last, uh, going back to the slide, what's the last one? Those, that's just the product of those two numbers. Oh, okay. Okay, so I said we've got these numbers. Where do they come from? Well, let's start. I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to assume that not everyone here knows EM. If that's false, excuse me, but it's easier to make that assumption. Thank you. Before you get into that, one thing. Uh, so you said the sentences were parsed, but you're not using any of the parse tree as features. You're just using it to extract the um, phrases. Um, I'm using it to extract the phrases. I'm using it to um, know the parts of speech. And in the more complicated model, I'm using a lot more. Yeah, but, like for things like reflexive. Oh, really yes, matters, yes. Right? And I'm also, uh, that's right, I actually haven't talked about reflexive. Uh, it uses that information for reflexive. All this seat stuff. Yeah, no, it does not have the full panoply of linguistic knowledge about reflexives. It's comparatively uninformed, but it does know that something in object position cannot denote the same thing that's the thing in subject position unless it's reflexive and vice versa. And so, yes, that, that's also a case where the parsing is important. Okay, so. Let's talk about where these numbers might come from. So suppose we had a lot of text with every pronoun labeled with its antecedent. And we wanted to know, given this text, what we wanted to estimate the probability that Alice would generate a feminine pronoun. Well, what we would do is we would say, take the number of times a feminine pronoun has Alice as its antecedent and divide by the number of times any pronoun has Alice. Similarly, to estimate the probability that a plural pronoun has a singular antecedent, we would you know, essentially do the same thing. The number of times a plural pronoun has a singular antecedent divided by the number of times any pronoun has a singular antecedent. Okay, and that's how we would estimate those probabilities if we had supervised data. Okay, so we hire 10,000 graduate students to annotate data and they go off. Occasionally, these grad students will be uncertain about the correct antecedent. And so what we're going to do is, we're, if they are uncertain, and this occurs about 5% of the time, 
usually these are cases where it doesn't really matter. I could give you some if you're interested to ask me later. Um, what do we do in those cases? And so what we're going to do is we're going to allow the graduate student to indicate what the possibilities are along with the student's estimate of the probability that each one of those is correct. Now, in the case where, where the student is sure, we, and we say, well, was Alice the antecedent? And we say yes, and we mark a one in the column for Alice and feminine pronoun. Well, here, if, we're, if it's 0.8, now instead of giving one, we give it 0.8. Okay. And so that's the basic idea. And EM just takes this to, is the ultimate generalization of this. So instead of, all, instead of having a person who is making this, we're just, we're just going to assign arbitrary, but typically closely uh, similar probabilities to all the cases. So in our case, we're going to say that initially, every pronoun and every antecedent has a one-third, uh, one-third, one-third probability of being, of generating masculine, feminine, or neuter. And then we can use our, if we have these numbers, we can now use our equation and compute. What's the probability that this thing's the antecedent? What's the probability that that thing's the antecedent? Okay. Um, and, just like in the graduate student case, where the graduate student marks something with, say, 0.8, here we're going to say, well, it's got a <coughs> 0.35 probability that it's this, that it's Alice, or whatever. When we add up these fractional counts, and then at the end we're going to normalize them, and that's how EM works, and then we're going to repeat this process. <coughs> So in each iteration, EM first computes the expectation of how often the data is generated using a particular random variable, like Alice is feminine. And then it maximizes the probability of the data by resetting the model parameters to, to agree with those expectations. And typically, in our case, we're just going to use the maximum likelihood estimator, which is the more or less obvious thing of dividing how often it happened by how often anything could have happened. And, and so that's the EM algorithm. Now, one thing that's sort of funny here is I said initially all of the antecedents are going to have exactly the same probability of being the antecedent. Well, all of the noun phrases. And that makes you think, well, if they're all equal, how will anything ever change? <laughs> why will the, why won't the probabilities just sort of always stay equal? Okay, and they don't. And what I'm going to do is try to give you some intuition here. Um, consider the probability of plural pronoun given plural antecedent. Okay, initially, uh, given that. Uh, there are two possibilities. It's going to either be singular or plural. They'll both be 50 percent. Okay. Now, let's think about the situation where we see a singular pronoun. Um, and we ask, what's the probability that, say, the nearest antecedent to it will be plural? The answer is it's slightly less than average because presumably one of the previous noun phrases is going to be has to be singular, right? Since there's a singular pronoun there, and so each one now has a slightly less chance of being. Plural. Similarly, if we see a plural pronoun, then the probability of seeing of the, a nearby one of seeing a nearby plural is significantly higher. So yes, 
the EM initially in the first iteration is going to assign them all equal, but the number of them won't be equal. There will be slightly more plural noun nouns near a plural pronoun than near a singular pronoun. And so the total counts, even though each individual count is equal with all its competitors, the total number of counts is going to go for that combination is going to go up. And EM is going to pick up on these things. It's very, very clever about this. Okay, so that's the intuition for why things are going to move off complete equality. Here are, in fact, the numbers that EM comes up with. So, in particular, this is the probability of seeing a singular pro pronoun given some antecedent. So, if the antecedent itself is singular, then it's 0.93. If it's plural, it's 0.04. And if it's neither singular nor plural, i.e., it's something other than a noun, might be a verb sometimes, uh, then it's 0.74. Okay, notice in particular that plural, a plural antecedent has a non-zero chance of producing a singular pronoun, and that is indeed correct. Okay? Something like uh, they can refer to IBM, where they is plural, IBM is singular. Okay? So, sorry, that's the other way. That's the other way. Yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking about. I, uh, uh, let's see. Um, no, no. Uh, so, suppose that. So here's my program is always looking for the most recent antecedent. Suppose we introduced IBM. Then we talked about they, and then we talked about IBM again. Okay. Um, no, no, that doesn't work. Uh, so, okay, so what I'm looking for is a singular antecedent, a plural antecedent, and a, um, I should have done, the, done it the other way, because there I have a, you know, a good example at hand. Yeah. I don't have a good example, but it does happen. That's why I was wondering about those numbers. Yeah. So a way to, but I can't think of that. Uh, yeah, I can't think of one either. It's probably, the number 0.04 is probably too high. You know, EM yeah. hasn't presumably gotten it mm. completely correct. But uh, I'm, sure they, I'm sure this occurs. Mm. I like the Sally Pot in the, in the kite, uh, and he doesn't like them. Yeah. Not great, but possible. There are mistakes too. Uh, not that many, but yeah. Okay. Uh, probability of gender given antecedent. Uh, so if the word Paul, it says 96% of the time it's going to generate a masculine pronoun, almost never a pronoun, never feminine or neuter. Okay. Paula. Now it's feminine, okay? Uh, so it quite clearly made the distinction between Paul and Paula. There's been a lot of interest in genders of pigs recently. Um, and uh, according to my program, uh, pigs are about 45% of the time masculine, 17% feminine, and 38% neuter. But on what corpus? Uh, well, this is uh, this is the North American News Corpus uh, from LDC, which uh, includes Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and, and some others. But not Charlotte's Web. No, not Charlotte's Web. <laughs> However, notice that Piggy is all, almost always feminine. I, I assume someone here can guess why. Right, this piggy. Um, so 
most of the time that Piggy is mentioned, it's Miss Piggy and she's feminine. Walmart is quite clearly neuter. So, you know, it makes mistakes, but most of the time it gets things right. And you can also see that it, it hedges its bets. It's uh, never quite as certain it probably is at all. Here's another one of the distributions and what EM comes up with. Uh, this is the person of the pronoun, given the person of the antecedent, and in this case I also condition on whether the antecedent is quoted or not, and you'll see why. So in the first set here, neither the antecedent nor the pronoun is quoted, and what you observe is look at the diagonal. First goes with first, second goes with second, and third goes with third. Everyone see that? The 92% in the first row, uh, the 89% in the second row, and the 97% in the third row. Everyone. So that's pretty intuitive, you, and that's what you'd expect. Okay. Notice, however, that if the antecedent is quoted, but the pronoun is not in a quotation, that goes away. Now everyone goes with third person. So if you have an I in a quoted section, and now you go to an unquoted section, that will probably go with a third person. Right? So if someone's talking in the quoted person, say Mr. Mr. Jones, and then in the unquoted section, it's Mr. Jones. Okay. So there you see a very different uh, phenomena where basically everyone wants to be third person outside the world. And again, EM is perfectly capable of making it on this. Uh, the last of these distributions is the most complicated. And that is the one, the probability of antecedent given context. That was the first one. So remember, first we guess the antecedent, and then we guess based on the antecedent, we guess gender and number and um, person. So the probability of the antecedent is conditioned on, and so many things. Okay. So the first thing we looked at before was what sentence is the antecedent in? Is it in the current one back or two back? Other things that influence this include the syntactic role of the antecedent. Uh, intuitively, well, it's well known that subjects of sentences are more likely antecedents than objects. And it's generally assumed that objects, in turn, are more likely than other possible roles. Um, so for example, if Alice was talking to Mary, she, then the she is more likely to be Alice, everything else being equal. Okay? This is centering theory and all sorts of other theories, all of which have this as a basic tenet, and sure enough, it's true. Another useful feature is whether the antecedent is, a, is itself a name, a pronoun, or a common noun. Um, intuitively, common nouns are less likely to be antecedents than either pronouns or proper nouns. So all told, my distribution is conditioned on three possible sentences, three possible syntactic roles, three possible antecedent types, six possible bins of where the antecedent occurs within the sentence, three possible positions for the pronoun, and three possible um, pronoun types. And when you multiply all those together, we're, we're giving EM about 2,500 parameters to play around with. And if your experience with EM has been anything like mine, this sounds lethal. EM is sure to do something not what you wanted when given this much leeway. Amazingly, it does not seem to be the case. Uh, I mean, I've already showed you uh, some other situations. This, now, when you've got 2,500 parameters, it's almost impossible to look at any one and get much intuition. Okay? So, what I've done here is um, let's consider the first row. Here I'm looking at the probability of an, um, that a particular antecedent is the antecedent given 
the, whether the antecedent itself is a pronoun, a proper noun, or a common noun. Now notice that, there's, that these numbers do not exist in the system. That these, in fact, what I've done is I've let everything else vary. So the first of these, pronoun, 0 0.09, what that says is that if you consider all probabilities in this huge array in which the antecedent type is a pronoun, and you take the geometric mean, the number you get out is 0 0.09. Whereas if you did this for proper noun, the number you'd get out is 0.06. Does everyone sort of get the intuition? So these are averages over many, many different cases to try to give some intuition about what the trends are. And as you see, in this case, I think the trends are exactly what you would anticipate, namely, Pronouns are much more likely to generate forthcoming pronouns than, than other things. And that's typically because if something's been pronominalized once, it's more likely to be pronominalized a second time. Similarly, proper nouns are more common than common nouns, and common nouns are the least. Uh, in fact, that works out so good, it looks like I made up the numbers, but those are, those are real. Um, Similarly, for antecedent word position, word position is measured starting from the pronoun. In the same sentence, you go backwards towards the start of the sentence, so the words closest to it are in position zero, bin zero. Uh, whereas for previous sentences, you start at the beginning and work your way forward. And sure enough, the closest are more likely than those slightly further away, which in turn are more likely than those still further away. The only case where I have found where things don't completely match my intuitions is in the last one. Sure enough, sub things in subject position really are more likely to be to generate the pronoun. Um, but objects, um, oh, I've got these reversed. Sorry, uh, that, uh, this is a bug. The number for other should be 0.05, and the number for object should be 0.04. In fact, objects are slightly less likely than other. However, the statistical significance of this is small. This is really, really so, close. So why? I mean, I know it will be computationally a bit of a problem, but um, I, mean, I, I would rather try to marginalize over those other things then I mean, maybe do some the Monte thing Carlo thing, uh, then computers geometric means, because I don't know what they, I mean, they are a little bit tricky, right? Because if there's something, is one, of the one of the probabilities is small and not the others. Yeah, I, I don't really care. I mean, these are just illustrative, okay? Oh, okay. Okay, I, I, mean, I, just, I would just say, as illustration goes. Yeah. Okay, uh, so far I've ignored Non-anaphoric pronouns, well, in fact, in this model, things are very, very simple. Basically, there's a small probability of generating a pronoun with, uh, um, any, without any reference. And so basically what this means is if none of the preceding pronouns look very good, it picks non-anaphoric, which is semi-reasonable and very simple. Evaluate any one individual program. And as, so, and as the question of who to evaluate against, what I did was I went to the Corpora news group or uh, email group and asked for all the programs that they knew uh, that are on the web that did pronoun anaphora, and I got this, these four. I subsequently um, discovered one other, but it didn't really work properly, and so I'm just sticking with these four. And so the question is, how well does my program compare to these programs? So how are we going to score? So every pronoun either has an antecedent or not. If it does not, it is only counted as correct if the model also decides that there is no antecedent. Okay. So that's, I think, fairly straightforward. 
if there is an antecedent, then for it to be correct, it must be put in the set from which it came, in the gold data. So intuitively, well, actually, you'll see, you'll see this in a second. And this scoring metric is known in the literature as Mitkoff's resolution etiquette. This is what he calls it, and this is his metric. So here's an example. Alice fed the dog, he wagged his tail. So in the gold standard, we have Alice in one group, the dog, he and his in another group. Okay? Now, we remove the he and the his, and we remove all the pronouns from all the groups. And we're assuming that every group has some non-pronominal noun phrase left in it, which is a pretty good assumption. So all the groups now, all the sets are well-defined, and what you now want to do is put back the pronouns back into the sets from which they came. And if it goes back in the right set, as in here, then it's correct. Otherwise, it's wrong. So in this case, everything is correct. Now, notice that here is the funny example. Suppose that we put Alice and the dog in both in one set and he and his in a separate set. Now, in one sense, the his could be claimed to be correct. After all, it is co-referent with the he, okay? But according to our metric, it's going to be scored wrong because the set that it has to go into is the one defined by the dog. It wasn't put there, it's wrong. Similarly, if he and his were put in the set with Alice, they would both be wrong. Okay, so is that reasonably clear how the metric works? Um, so what about uh, non-anaphoric uh, noun phrases that refer to the same thing? You know, we've got George Bush and the president. Do they have to go together? And if not, does it matter which one? Uh, so those are anaphoric, but they're, 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 not, they're not pronouns. And so, so far, I'm only looking at pronouns. Right. So, how does this metric handle cases that have those kinds of things? Oh, uh, it doesn't. This, it's this. The metric I have just described only works for the case of pronouns. It does not work for the general situation, which is much more complicated. Okay. Fortunately, for pronouns, it's fairly straightforward. But no, this, this metric cannot be used for the general case. But it is what is used for pronouns. So why, why don't they just do the simple thing and say, if, they, like if the link is in the gold standard, then count that as right? Um, the, you mean for the, not, for, for the complete case beyond well, pronouns? No, even for pronouns, too, like, uh, like if you if you have he and his in a separate group, you, you kind of count this as like one correct. Uh, I don't know, but at one point that's what I was doing, and people said that's not the standard. Well, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any strong intuitions about what the right thing to do is in that case is, and. Uh, as far as I can tell, the, met the two metrics go up and down together uh, with the case with your version being about 4 to 5 percent higher because of the case where two pronouns can go together but have the wrong thing further back, okay? So, but they go up in tandem. I've yet to find a case where, you know, well, that's not true. But Anyway, I have taken what has been used previously because it's been used previously, rather than making up a new one. Okay, so um, the unlabeled data was about a half billion words of parsed North American news text from LDC. Well, actually, yeah, the North American news text is from LDC. We parsed it, and now you can get the 50 best parses for all of that from LDC, which we contributed to them. This consists of about 750,000 news articles from various 
newspapers. Um, I missed this one. The experimental, the, the development data and the test data is from the work of Niu G back in 99. She marked up the sections 0 and 1 of the Penn Tree Bank with pronouned co-referent annotations. And we use 0 as the development set and 1 as the test set. And the numbers I'm reporting are on the test set, which is section 1. This has 900, uh, has 1,119 personal pronouns, of which 906 are anaphoric, and the rest are non-anaphoric. Um, and as I said, this is the training data, and he here are the results. Okay, um, as you can see, ours at the bottom quite clearly dominates all of the rest. Uh, it's not particularly close. The best of the others was Open NLP, which, particularly given that, notice that I should mention that BART, Guitar, and Open NLP do complete co-reference. Okay, so this is, I'm, in a sense, this is slightly unfair to them because I'm just taking a piece of what they do and comparing it. Okay, but I have no other, you know, things to compare against. And the one program there that only does um, pronouns is Java Wrap, and it's very old and not particularly good. Um, two pronouns, Java Wrap only handles third person, and so I only tested it on third person. There's this, uh, there's this uh, evaluations, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I never worked on that, well, I worked once a little bit on this, but uh, there's some res you know, some work that people have been doing, like uh, Andrew McCallum, and um, I guess Pedro Domingos, at where they've there's some sets I guess from uh, uh, must it's from Muck. Ace, Muck Muck or Ace, Ace. Yes. yeah. So so if you look at those, okay. they have some numbers. I don't know. Of course, it's not just pronouns. That's right. But you could restrict to pronouns, I guess. Yes. Okay. So the major problem there is Muck and Ace have almost no pronouns. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, no, no. It, it's a perfectly good question. Um, so they are not very good for testing on pronouns. Um, and furthermore, most people who report their full numbers don't report their pronoun numbers. And finally, uh, and this is off the record, I don't trust any numbers that I can't reproduce myself. And, and should that, that be off the record? I, I, I'm very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm saying is I just don't believe all my, my, my co-workers, okay? Uh, which it might be healthy, been, but I've isn't... I've been able to re recently been able to review some of the ACE numbers okay. pretty closely. Okay, good. So I, I, did, I used to have the same attitude with respect to those numbers. Uh -huh. I, I'm now slightly right. less skeptical. Okay. Uh, so basically what I just decided I was going to do was take programs that I could actually run. Mm -hmm. And these were the four. Now, uh, notice that BART, I, I don't actually give a number. It's less than 40%, and I think that's just what that means is, is that the BART system as shipped doesn't work, okay? And in particular, there seems to be a problem not with the program, but with the model behind the program. It's, it's, it's strange. Um, and we've written them, but not gotten any answers that we so can. The other question I have is, since you're parsing, you know, there's this old uh, uh, rule-based antecedent method uh, due to Jerry Hobbs. Yes. Did you compare? It's easy to implement. Oh, you know, yeah. You have trees. Uh, Take my word, uh, it will maybe do 30% on this metric. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Maybe, no, maybe a bit more, maybe 40%. Yeah. But not well, 40% is like, yeah. it's kind of a nice baseline, right? You know, if right. you add some, uh, a little bit of additional information, you might. Those features may or may not be interesting. That's oh, no, no. Jerry Hobbs' features are, in yeah. particular, 
basically what the Hobbes algorithm implements are three features. Um, one is it's sensitive to ref the uh, constraints on reflexives. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's, it likes things in subject positions. Okay. And thirdly, it likes things that are closer rather than further away. So the first one is the one you would want to add. The other two you already do it. Uh, uh, I have a, um, a little bit of the reflexive stuff, but not as yeah. much as Jerry does. So yes, uh, a full-fledged program that captures current linguistic theory on reflexives would improve things slightly. Okay. So, um, and as I say at the top, you you should be aware that these comparisons are tricky. Okay. All of the programs, for example, have different output conventions. And so it's not as if you just, you know, take their output, put them through the same scorer, and get a number, because you won't. And so uh, what we actually did is my, my co-author and I independently wrote scores for each of these things and then compared our numbers, you know, just to make sure we didn't do anything obviously stupid. So these numbers at least... Two, in, two independent programs came up with the same set of numbers, or in one case, they were half a percent apart, and we took the higher one. Um, so we, I think that these numbers are pretty good, but this is by no means a slam dunk. Um, well, and so anyway, the, so the result is that we have very comp a very competitive program. I'm going to be putting it up on the web. Certainly, th this was submitted to the European ACL. Uh, if they accept it, it'll go up on the web then. It'll probably go up on the web sometime about that period. I'm working, as I say, right now this program takes in sentences and outputs F measures, okay, <laughs> which is not what most people want from a program like this. Uh, so the, essentially the highest thing on my agenda right now is to change that so it outputs parses with co-reference marked up. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah. It looks like this has this uh, nice side effect of actually assigning gender to various works, which might be important for safety. Yes. So we should consider marketing it also in that department. This actually is useful. To <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Shane, uh, Shane Bergsma uh, did some work on this uh, gender probability distribution. And uh, like you, you mentioned one paper, but in another work, like, uh, it, like it's, it's simpler. Like uh, it didn't it didn't involve EM, but you if you kind of you, you have some uh, pretty lightly uh, possess uh, sorry uh, co-reference patterns, like uh, uh, say uh, non-verb possessive, right? And, and usually kind of it's sort of a co-reference relation, mm -hmm. and uh, and then like there, there's a sort of a small number of these kind of patterns, and then if you extract all of these instances from corpus, right, and then you you get uh, you get dog uh, uh, verb uh, his or dog verb its, and so right, mm -hmm. and then and then you you just count because like for these pronouns you know the gender and then. I just use this distribution mm -hmm. for, the, for the distribution of like the gender for dog, and, and uh, it doesn't involve EM. Yeah, Is involve that a benefit? Well, like it, it, it uh, you get a probability distribution. Right. And, and so uh, do I. Yeah. Except I get them on more because I'm using every pronoun. Uh, but but this. Here you, you get uh, like a, 
all you want is the uh, uh, the gender information, right? You uh, say here. It's so I'll, dog I'll just and the I'll, I'll just send you my gender information. I'm <coughs> Uh, well, what's uh, okay? Is well, there some point to this? Yeah, uh, I, the point <laughs> is uh, like you you can get this uh, gender distribution like one of your tables without, without doing EM. Yeah. Yes. And these patterns might be pretty useful for extracting. Yeah. Well. And, and, yeah. Uh, I. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, you do a uniform initialization in EM, right? You just, if you have three choices, you just have one, That's right. Three. Did you consider or explore other non-uniform initialization? No. I, the one thing I do do, because it's traditional in EM, you know, at least from the EM work in um, starting with the IBM machine translation models, is to start EM on a simpler distribution and use that to initialize and then go on to the more. So I do that. And I've never tried it without it. Um, I assume like MT, you know, uh, the uh, IBM 1 is convex, but I, you know, but as soon as you move beyond IBM 1, it's no longer convex and you have local optima. But if you just first train on IBM 1, it does very well. I assume the situation is similar here, but I haven't investigated it. Usually, you never uh, initialize using a uniform distribution. You always jigger it a little bit. But it's, it's interesting that yours is able to. Uh, this is evolve. asymmetric. It, it's, there's no saddle point there. So you don't have to worry about jiggering. So have you done other feature exploration? Not yet. Um, the major feature that I don't have is counting how often each antecedent has been mentioned. OK? And the reason I don't have it is because this is just pronouns. It's, this doesn't work for, on full NP reference which is what you need if you want to have that feature. And so, in fact, as I said, the first thing on my agenda is to get this program producing useful output. Um, after that, I would say the next thing is to start thinking about a similar approach to full NP coref. At which point, then, I will introduce that feature as well. I mean, there are lots of things that could improve this program. We don't handle catafra. We don't handle, we, the program does not know that a conjoined NP can be a plural. Um, as I say, its knowledge of um, the syntax of reflexives is very primitive. Um, as I also said, it only looks at pronouns two sentences back. If you try to extend it, things actually get worse because it gets um, distracted by these extra, prono extra noun phrases way back. And presumably, that's because EM is not giving a sharp enough distribution to make those sufficiently unlikely. Um, but I haven't really looked at that. And that would be another thing, too, that would. So there are lots of things, ways you can improve this. But the major thing, I think, is to, make, is to go on and uh, handle full NP co-reference. What about performance as a function of the iteration? Do things the no, that's, it, it's uh, insensitive. Uh, basically, things, performance improves up to about iteration 14, and after that, it's stable. Okay, it does not seem to overtrain. Uh, now, this is going up to about 30. I make no guarantees for what would happen if you went to 30,000, you know, but certainly from 15 to 30, nothing, nothing happens. And it does improve going up to 15, although at the end, it's, the improvement is not statistically significant, but. It is an improvement. And are all the features important? 
Uh, as far as I can tell, but I, I mean, you know how these things work. You start out with a very simple model, and you add things, and you stop adding when things don't help. Okay. Um, so as far as I know, everything I presented here helps, but all that says is, is given the order in which I implemented them, they help. Whether if I had implemented them in a different order, they would have, you know, who knows. Do we have any ideas like uh, how humans would do like, uh, on this task? Oh, yeah, humans are virtually perfect. As I said, uh, humans will get it, will agree 95% of the time, roughly. Uh, and the and then assuming that they disagree in just one of two possibilities, then the, then they will get it right, quote unquote, uh, ninety-seven and a half percent of the time. Um, in fact, that last five percent are things like the following. I said that there are cases where it doesn't doesn't really matter which one you pick, or the the case is subtle. So uh, one, one of the examples I was looking at in the marked up corpus went something like this. Um, it, there were two antecedents, one of, of, of a pronoun it. One was the XYZ Corporation, and the other one was the XYZ Corporation subsidiary. subsidiary. Okay. And the pronoun was just something about, you know, they may have some trouble coming up. And presumably, if the company he was having trouble, then the subsidiary might be having trouble and vice versa. You know, it, it wasn't, it didn't really matter a lot. The corpus decided, the, the Neo G, when she marked it up, said it was a subsidiary. I think that's probably the intention, but who knows? And that that's right. No, in fact, in fact, that was 19. I mean, that was the Wall. Remember, this is the Wall Street Journal from I don't know what year was uh, the Tree Bank Corpus done. <laughs> so yes, I'm sure they're all out of business. Well, thanks again. Mm -hmm.